In this film, I'm going to cover the safe operation of oxygen equipment in your home. There are many different types of oxygen equipment covered in this film. Please make sure you know which ones you have been prescribed and watch the sections that are relevant for you. The first one is on general safety of oxygen in your home and it is relevant for everybody who has been prescribed home oxygen. The second section is on oxygen concentrators. These are the machines that are plugged into an electrical socket inside the home and provide a constant supply of oxygen. The third section is on oxygen cylinders with regulators. They are a portable supply of oxygen for short trips outside the home that supply a constant supply of oxygen. The fourth section is on oxygen cylinders with conservers. They are portable oxygen for short trips outside the home with a special device that only provides oxygen when you are breathing in. Please make sure you know which sections are relevant to the oxygen equipment that you have been prescribed and ensure that you watch all of those sections before taking your equipment home. During this film we will be referring to several people. These are the prescriber is a medical consultant or senior doctor who oversees your oxygen therapy. The respiratory nurse is a nurse that comes out to check up on you and how you are going on your oxygen. The oxygen provider is a district health board department that issues the equipment to you and provides you the education on how to safely use your equipment. The oxygen supplier is BOC Gases or their designated local depot from who you get your oxygen cylinders. Section 1 is on the general safety issues of having oxygen in your home. The first thing is that you should have a plan around your oxygen therapy, including the key people involved in your care, your respiratory medical specialist, your respiratory nurse, your oxygen equipment providers and your caregivers. Know and understand your oxygen requirements, know your flow rate, the amount of oxygen you are to receive, how long and in what situations you should be using your oxygen, what to do in emergency situations. If you don't know any of these details, please contact your prescriber or your respiratory nurse to find out what those details are. We're moving on to the safety. Most of the issues around safety of home oxygen relate to the risk of fire. We're just going to show you the fire triangle. You're going to see this fire triangle many times during this film. This illustrates the three components required for a fire to be able to start and burn. You have oxygen, heat and fuel. The presence of these three components together causes a fire to start. An increase in any of these components increases the risk of a fire significantly. Air is normally around 21% oxygen. As not all the oxygen produced by your equipment is breathed in, the ratio of oxygen to other gases in the air is increased. For this reason, we recommend that when oxygen is in use, Either a door or a window is left open to reduce the buildup of oxygen in the room. Oxygen is heavier than air, so will sit in facial hair and on clothing for a period of time after removing the oxygen source. So that is removing the nasal prongs. This means that your clothes have a higher risk of catching a light even after you have removed the oxygen source. Safety precautions must remain in place for some time once the oxygen source has been removed. The first safety issue we have to cover is the risk of serious harm associated with smoking and oxygen use. Cigarette smoking is one of the most significant hazards with home oxygen therapy. It is extremely important that your house is strictly a smoke free environment. We are making your environment very rich in oxygen and the cigarette provides the fuel and the heat required to make the fire triangle complete. Every cigarette lit or smoked in the house increases the risk of igniting the oxygen. Any flame will travel in the direction of the oxygen flow, which is towards the person and the airways. The outcome from this is always painful and often fatal. When you are supplied your oxygen equipment, you will be given a smoke-free area sign. We recommend that you hang this sign in a prominent place at the entry to your house. This sign is also a signal to emergency services that you have oxygen in your house and that extra precautions may be required when they are responding to an emergency at your house. In addition to the increased risk of harmful inhalation of flames, studies have shown that oxygen therapy only improves the amount of oxygen carried in the blood 
in patients with chronic lung disease, or COPD, who have stopped smoking. It is not only smoking that we have to have an awareness of. There are other sources of heat and fuel around the house that we also need to be aware of. Household heating. The safest types of household heating are those that have no exposed heat source. Heat pumps, radiator heaters, underfloor heating and oil column heaters are the safest types of heating. The riskier types of heating are certainly your open box and gas fires, your gas heaters, bar heaters and fan heaters. Fires. While on oxygen therapy, you, the equipment and the attached tubing must remain as far away from any fires as possible. A minimum of three metres is recommended. You should never light or stoke the fire while oxygen is in use. The kitchen and cooking. Where practical, we advise that the combination of home oxygen and the kitchen are avoided, or at a minimum, used with caution. For people who don't need to use oxygen all of the time, it is important to avoid using it while in the kitchen. For the many people who do require oxygen for most or all of the day, while in the kitchen it is important to be conscious of where your tubing is, with particular caution around the cooktop, the toaster and the open oven as these are exposed elements and pose the same risk as other heating sources. Gas cooktops are the most hazardous method of cooking for you. In the event of a fire starting in association with your oxygen use, water, CO2, that's carbon dioxide, and powder fire extinguishers are all considered suitable, depending on the fuel source. Fire extinguishers have additional information on them to let you know what fuels they can be used on, so please make sure you are familiar with yours prior to needing to use it. We recommend that if you don't already have a fire extinguisher in your house, that you do get one. Driving whilst on oxygen. The New Zealand Transport Agency have recommendations around the safety of driving with certain medical conditions. In the Medical Aspects of Fitness to Drive section, there is the following statement that relates to driving. It states that medical standards for all licensed classes and or endorsement types. Severe respiratory conditions or severe respiratory failure can affect the ability to drive safely, but in most cases, by the time the patient is at this stage, it will be apparent to that individual that they are unfit to drive. However, in conditions such as asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, particularly when associated with significant emphysema, the possibility of disabling episodes of loss of consciousness should be considered and individuals should be warned not to drive during severe attacks or exacerbations. Individuals on continuous oxygen therapy are generally considered unfit to drive. The COPD Foundation has demonstrated that low oxygen levels can impair brain function and physical ability, affecting many of the mental and physical processes required for driving. For example, problem solving and simple motor skills become more difficult. Please consider this very thoroughly when you are thinking about driving a car. Please discuss this with your doctor. It is also important to remember that if you are wearing your oxygen in the car, the air will have a higher percentage of oxygen than normal air, which greatly increases the risk of a fire starting following a collision or other accident. We advise that you notify your insurance company that you have home oxygen equipment and how you're storing it, as they may have additional requirements that you need to follow. We would also like for you to place the oxygen concentrator as an item on your policy to ensure that it is fully covered in the event of theft or fire. There are times when you may wish to travel while using oxygen. Travel whilst on home oxygen therapy is possible but does involve significant amount of organisation. Our advice is to plan your trip and seek advice from your oxygen service provider and your doctor early, especially if involving air travel. If the travel is local and by car, the concentrator can be transported in the car as detailed in the concentrator section and used at the destination, assuming there is a regular power supply. If the oxygen cylinders are required for the journey, 
you need to discuss this with the oxygen service provider who will be able to offer advice on obtaining cylinders for you. They will also be able to provide you contact details of cylinder exchange outlets and options to assist you with the oxygen supply at the other end. If travelling by air, you must contact your oxygen service provider as early as possible as there is a lengthy process to be followed which involves your doctor, BFC gases and the airline. Travel oxygen required to attend medical appointments is usually funded by the Ministry of Health via the oxygen service providers. However, costs associated for non-medical travel should be checked with your DHB. It is important that your oxygen provider has your current contact details. This is important so that they can get in contact with you around the routine servicing of your equipment or any other issues that may arise. If you do change your contact details, please notify your provider as soon as possible. There is a limited supply of oxygen equipment available, so we do ask that when it is no longer required, it is returned as soon as possible. Each piece of equipment will state where it is to be returned to in the booklet accompanying it. Key points from Section 1. Being on home oxygen and having equipment in your house and vehicle increases the risk of fire in these areas. Smoking is not allowed around oxygen equipment by anyone in the area, including yourself. Be aware of all heat sources and keep a safe distance away. Notify your insurance company you have oxygen equipment in your house. Travel is possible but does take some organisation and may incur costs. Keep your contact details updated and return the oxygen equipment as soon as it is no longer needed. This is section 2. It is on your oxygen concentrator. In this section, I'm going to be showing you how to use your oxygen concentrator safely. We're going to start with how your oxygen concentrator works and proceed from there. We predominantly use Respironics Everflow concentrators. If we supply you with another brand, the differences will be explained in person by one of our staff. This machine works by taking in air from the environment and separating the oxygen from this using a molecular sieve and pressure swing absorption process and pumping the oxygen out through the oxygen outlet port here. Air is normally around 21% oxygen. As not all the oxygen produced by your equipment is breathed in, the ratio of oxygen to other gases in the air is increased. It is therefore important to keep your concentrator in a place where there is good circulation of clean air, as the quality of the oxygen coming out is only as good as the quality of the air going in. Somewhere in a relatively open space, at least 30 centimetres away from any wall, furniture or curtains, and close to a window or door that is regularly opened is ideal. The concentrator must not be used while in a cupboard, wardrobe or cluttered area. The concentrator will operate efficiently at a temperature range from 13 to 32 degrees Celsius. Please be mindful of this in deciding where to keep your concentrator. Temperatures in winter can fall below this in many houses and may result in the concentrator alarming. Plugging in your concentrator and getting started. Your concentrator must be plugged directly into an electrical wall socket. Multiboards, extension cords and double plugs cannot be used as the concentrator requires the full power to ensure it is working as efficiently as it can. When you first turn on your concentrator the alarm will sound and the alarm lights on the control panel will be on. This is to ensure that the alarms and the lights are working. If these do not go on when you turn it on each time, please contact your oxygen provider. The contact number will be in your booklet relating to the concentrator. We will need to have the concentrator checked. After a short time, the alarm will stop, the lights will revert to just the green light being on, indicating that the concentrator is running correctly. If either the alarm or the red or orange light does not stop, please check the cord is plugged in and the power socket is turned on, and that you have power to surrounding areas. Check the tubing is not twisted or kinked and is attached correctly to the oxygen port then contact your oxygen provider. Again, the contact number will be in your booklet relating to the concentrator. Again, that is because we will need to have the concentrator checked. We do ask that the concentrator is not frequently switched on and off. After only a few minutes, it is, this is not good for the motor. 
These machines are designed to be running for long periods of time. If the alarm or either the red or orange light comes on whilst the concentrator is in use, please check that the cord is plugged in, that the power socket is turned on and that you have power to your home by checking that your other appliances are working. Check that the tubing looks fine, that it is not twisted and that there are no kinks in it. If you have pets, they may attack the tubing and leave small holes. It is a good idea to routinely check your tubing for this as it will require replacement. You can check that oxygen is coming out the outlet barb by holding your finger in front of the outlet barb and you should feel a light stream of air. You can check the flow rate indicator is working by placing your finger over the outlet barb. The flow meter should return to zero and then bounce back up when your finger is removed. You can also place the nasal cannula into water. The presence of bubbles indicates oxygen is flowing. If you cannot find or correct the issue, please contact your oxygen provider. The contact number will be in your booklet. We will need to have the concentrator brought in and checked. The flow rate you require is determined by your doctor. The prescribed flow rate will be provided to you in the written material supplied with the concentrator. It is important to stick to this flow rate as for some conditions it is harmful to increase your oxygen flow rate. If you think you need more oxygen it is important to discuss this with your doctor as they know what is appropriate for your condition. Setting the correct flow rate is done by adjusting the knob on the flow meter until the ball is centered on the correct line of the flow meter. Connecting the tubing. You have been supplied with extension tubing, nasal prongs, or in some circumstances a mask, and a joiner to connect them together. One end of the extension tubing attaches to the concentrator, like this. The other end is connected to the nasal prongs using the joiner, like this. The nasal prongs are worn by placing the two nasal prongs in the nostrils, draping the tubing over the ears, so that the tubing meets under the chin, like this. Your nasal prongs should be checked daily to ensure that they are not blocked. They can be wiped with a damp cloth. Do not use detergents or cleaners on them, as this can harden the plastic and make them uncomfortable. You can change your nasal prongs when needed to maintain a reasonable level of comfort. These should be changed several times a year. It is important to keep a spare set of nasal prongs on hand. The extension tubing is 7.5 metres long and the nasal prongs with attached tubing is 2.1 metres long. This gives you around 9.5 metres of movement from your concentrator, which is sufficient for most houses. You are not to add on additional tubing to increase the distance you can move around your house, as this will reduce the amount of oxygen that is delivered to you. There is a risk of tripping over your tubing as it lies on the floor. This is a potential hazard for yourself and everyone in the house, and you all need to be aware and mindful. Sometimes your extension tubing or nasal tubing can get a kink in it, like this. This will result in pressure going back to the concentrator, which will make the alarm sound. If the alarm activates, you should check the full length of the extension tubing and the nasal prongs for kinks. You should be able to straighten them out and resolve the problem, but occasionally they will require replacement. Maintaining your concentrator. Because the quality of the oxygen provided by your concentrator is only as good as the quality of the air entering it, it is important to keep the concentrator clean and dust free. This should be done by wiping it down with a cloth dampened with water only. Please do not use chemical cleaners as these pose a fire risk. Cleaning your concentrator should be done once a week. It is also good to run a vacuum cleaner over the intake and buffer to reduce the buildup of dust. This should be done more frequently if you have pets, as the pet hair can get stuck in the air inlet, reducing the flow of air into the concentrator. Transporting your concentrator safely. Your concentrator is quite heavy and therefore, if not secured in the car, could cause significant damage and injury if the vehicle is stopped quickly or if you are involved in an accident. The concentrator must be transported in an upright position. 
One of the safest places to transport the concentrator is between the front and back passenger seats in the car. You move the front passenger seat forward, place the concentrator in like this, and then move this front seat back as far as it can go so that the concentrator is wedged in as tight as it will go. Oxygen concentrators require a constant supply of electricity. You'll be supplied with a document stating that you're on a medical device that requires a constant supply of electricity for life-saving therapy. We advise that you forward this on to your electricity supplier. This will mean that your electricity supplier will ensure that they get in touch with you before any planned power outages so that you can make other arrangements. This does not mean that you do not have to pay your power bill. They are still entitled to disconnect your power if you do not pay, but they must communicate with you about this first. Not all power outages are scheduled. If your power goes out, you will need to decide what to do. People have different requirements. Some can go for long periods of time without oxygen, while others will become symptomatic after only a few minutes. If you have cylinders, you can switch to those, but be mindful, they only last for a limited time and you need to have something else sorted for when they run out. Ambulances have oxygen, as does the hospital. So depending on the urgency of your need, you can call an ambulance or make your way to the hospital. You are the person who needs to judge the urgency of your oxygen needs. It is ideal to have a plan in mind before this happens. How you heat your house is an important consideration. We will refer back to the fire triangle. Your tubing acts as the fuel, and therefore, if there is enough direct heat, you can have a fire on your hands quite quickly, a situation we would like to avoid. Heat pumps and column heaters are the safest. Bar heaters should be avoided, and if using a fan heater, it is important to ensure that the concentrator and the tubing are kept well away from the heater. We realise that many people still use fires as the main heating source in the home. If this is the case, it is important to ensure that the concentrator and tubing are kept well away from the fire, preferably a minimum distance of 3 metres. We also recommend that the person using oxygen is not the person who lights or stokes the fire, even after turning off or removing the oxygen equipment from the person in the area. This is because oxygen is heavier than air and can sit on the clothing for some time, increasing the risk of catching clothing alight. This is also a risk for those who are in close proximity to those on oxygen. Those that are sleeping in the same bed as somebody who's on oxygen through the night and then getting up and lighting the fire in the morning. Or sitting next to the oxygen user on the couch for several hours and then going and adding some wood to the fire. Whilst you can wear your oxygen in the shower, it is important that you keep the concentrator outside of the bathroom. And just to reinforce that it is important that you notify your insurance provider that you have the oxygen concentrator in your house. We would also like to remind you that we would like you to place it as an item on your insurance policy to ensure that it is covered in the event of theft or an accident. Oxygen concentrators require annual servicing. Your concentrator will have a label on it stating when this servicing is due. Please keep an eye on this date. If we have not contacted you to arrange for your concentrator to be serviced by one week prior to this date, please contact your service provider to have this arranged. The key points from Section 2. Position in a well-ventilated area. Plug your concentrator directly into an electrical wall socket. Keep to your prescribed flow rate. Clean with a cloth dampened by water only, once a week. Transport and store upright. Be aware of where your tubing is. Tripping and fire risk. Notify your insurance company. And remember the annual servicing. And always have a plan in case the power goes out.
Section number three, oxygen cylinders with a regulator. Oxygen cylinders contain pressurized gas. The cylinder is solid and there is very little chance of damaging the actual cylinder. The connection on the top, while still strong, is the weak part. If this gets knocked, either by something falling onto it or by it falling over and knocking on something else, the pressure of the oxygen escaping from the cylinder will turn it into a lethal object. If the top is knocked off completely, the cylinder will become like a torpedo, destroying everything in its way for quite a distance. If the top is only partially broken, then the cylinder will spin on the ground. The force that it is spinning with is enough to sever a foot or hand if you attempt to stop it. It is important for everyone to get clear and let it spin until all the gas is out and it stops on its own. The safe transport of oxygen cylinders. Oxygen cylinders need to be transported upright and secure. They need to be secure enough that if you stop suddenly, either intentionally or in an accident situation, they will stay in position. They are heavy and if they are not secured, they can come through the car and injure anyone sitting in front of them. Or the top can be broken off, which will cause them to torpedo, potentially injuring or even killing anyone in its path. Any damage caused to the cylinder also increases the risk of fire and becomes a hazard to other people involved in or trying to assist following an accident. Oxygen cylinders in the home must be stored upright and secured so that they can't fall over, if knocked, or in a minor earthquake. In a garage is ideal, it is also important to check that nothing can fall onto them, off a shelf for example. They must also be stored separate from any other gas cylinders and in a well ventilated area. Connecting the regulator to the cylinder. We're going to look at the fire triangle again. Both oxygen, a very, very concentrated amount, and heat, which is created by the force of the oxygen coming through a small outlet, are there every time you use an oxygen cylinder. You therefore need to be extremely careful not to add a fuel to the fire triangle. There is a number of fuel sources that are so common most wouldn't think of them. The natural oils on your hands, any moisturisers that you have used, any food that may have been on your hands, and any dust that may be in or around the valve of the cylinder. It is therefore very important to thoroughly wash and dry your hands, ensuring all washing products are well rinsed off every time before using the cylinder. Do not use hand sanitizers, as these are usually alcohol based and dramatically increase the risk of fire. To reduce the risk associated with the potential of dust collecting near the valve of the cylinder, keep the white seal on until the time the cylinder is required to be connected. Vent the valve before connecting the cylinder like this. This ensures that any dust is blown from the area and will no longer pose a problem. Once you have connected the regulator, leave it connected until the cylinder is empty and it is time to connect the regulator to the next cylinder. Connecting the regulator to the cylinder. Every time you go to fit the regulator to a new cylinder, check the cylinder is oxygen. It will have a tag on it stating that it is oxygen, but it is important that you check the label on the actual cylinder. Tags can come off and be mixed up and are not a reliable check. Always have the cylinder on the ground when fitting the regulator. Holding onto the cylinder or placing it on furniture, even a table, increases the risk of the cylinder being dropped or knocked and resulting in one of the dangerous situations we've described earlier. Your regulator should look like this. It has a T-handle that secures your regulator to the cylinder post. Have this wound out when putting it on. It has two indexing pins below the valve which is surrounded by a Bodox seal. These match the configuration of the holes on the cylinder post. The configuration of the pins on the oxygen regulator is specific to cylinders which contain oxygen and will not fit any other cylinder. This is the cylinder contents pressure gauge which will tell you how much oxygen is left in the cylinder when the cylinder is open. This is the oxygen outlet barb, which is where your tubing will connect. This is the flow selection dial, which you use to select your flow rate. This is shown in the flow indicator window here. This needs to be set at zero before connecting the regulator to the cylinder. When you place your regulator over the cylinder posts, the pins and valve configuration should easily fit into place. If these do not match up, do not force them. This may indicate that the gas cylinder you have been given is not oxygen. 
Take the cylinder back to the gas supply company for checking. This is a safety mechanism with all gas cylinders and that all gas cylinders have specific pin and valve configurations to reduce the risk of using the wrong gas. Once the regulator is in place on the cylinder post, you tighten the T-handle by screwing it clockwise until it is firm. Hand tight is all that is required. Your cylinder is still closed, so your pressure gauge should read zero. If this has any reading on it at all, check that the cylinder is still closed. If the cylinder is still closed and the pressure gauge is not reading zero, your cylinder may be leaking. Contact the gas supplier, BOC Gases, to inform them of this and arrange the return of the cylinder immediately. The contact details of your local BOC company or BOC agent will be in the booklet you have been given. Now you open the oxygen cylinder. The needle on the gauge will move around to the green section, indicating that the cylinder is full. You connect the nasal prongs to the outlet barb. You must not use the extension tubing with the cylinders. You can now turn the flow selection dial to the flow rate you have been prescribed. Position the nasal prongs like this, ensuring there are no kinks or twists, and breathe normally through your nose. The length of time your cylinder lasts will depend on your flow rate. These times are only approximate and a copy of these times is also in the booklet you have been given. Oxygen cylinders are intended to be used by patients when they need to leave the home or in a few occasions for patients on very low flow rates, which concentrators do not manage. Usually these are very young children and neonates. Oxygen cylinders need to be kept upright when mobilising. They can be carried like this, just like carrying a baby, in a backpack or in some kind of trolley where they are secure. They must never be carried by the cylinder post on the top. You will need to decide which is the best method for you. When you have finished your session on the cylinder, you first turn the flow selection dial to zero. You then close the valve on the oxygen cylinder which stops the oxygen leaving the cylinder. You now turn the flow selection dial back on until the pressure gauge reads zero and then turn the flow selection dial back to zero. This protects the regulator and there are now two barriers preventing the oxygen escaping from the cylinder. When your oxygen cylinder is empty, you must make sure that the oxygen cylinder is closed and the flow selection dial is turned to zero. You can then remove the regulator from the top of the cylinder by unscrewing the T-handle, turning it anti-clockwise, until the regulator easily slips off the top of the cylinder and you immediately connect it to the next cylinder so that it is ready for you when you need to use it. Oxygen cylinders are obtained from BOC Gases or one of their agents. An account will have been set up for you at BOC Gases so that all you need to do is present to BOC Gases and provide your name and address. The number of cylinders that you have been allocated is provided in the brochure you were given. This will be based on your location and anticipated need. When your cylinder runs out, you can take them to BOC Gases and swap them for a full cylinder, or in some areas delivery is available. All cylinders issued to patients are charged to the District Health Board, whether they are empty or full, so it is important that you return an empty one each time you collect a full one. If you do not think the number of cylinders you have been allocated is enough, please contact your oxygen provider to discuss this. The storage of gas cylinders can be an issue on some insurance policies, so we'd like to advise you to get in touch with your insurance company and check if they have any regulations around the storage of your oxygen cylinders. Your regulator must be serviced on a regular basis. There is a small label on the regulator showing the date that this is due. If your provider has not contacted you prior to this date, please contact them to organise the servicing of this device. Your nasal prongs should be checked daily to ensure they are not blocked. They can be wiped with a damp cloth. Do not use detergents or cleaners on them, as that can harden the plastic and make them uncomfortable. You can change your nasal prongs when needed to maintain a reasonable level of comfort. These should be changed several times each year. It is important to keep a spare set of nasal prongs on hand. Key points for section 3. An oxygen cylinder must be transported and stored upright and secured. Confirm if your insurance company has any additional storage requirements. In the event of a rocketing or spinning cylinder due to damage, never try to stop it. Clean and dry your hands thoroughly before using your cylinders. 
Always fit your regulator with a cylinder on the floor. If the regulator does not fit on easily, do not force it. Oxygen cylinders contain pressurised gas. The cylinder is solid and there is very little chance of damaging the actual cylinder. The connection on the top, while still strong, is the weak part. If this gets knocked, either by something falling onto it or by it falling over and knocking on something else, the pressure of the oxygen escaping from the cylinder will turn it into a lethal object. If the top is knocked off completely, the cylinder will become like a torpedo, destroying everything in its way for quite a distance. If the top is only partially broken, then the cylinder will spin on the ground. The force that it is spinning with is enough to sever a foot or hand if you attempt to stop it. It is important for everyone to get clear and let it spin until all the gas is out and it stops on its own. Therefore, we need to be very careful in how we transport and store oxygen cylinders. The safe transport of oxygen cylinders. Oxygen cylinders need to be transported upright and secure. They need to be secure enough that if you stop suddenly, either intentionally or in an accident situation, they will stay in position. They are heavy and if they are not secured, they can come through the car and injure anyone sitting in front of them. Or the top can be broken off, which will cause them to torpedo, potentially injuring or even killing anyone in its path. Any damage caused to the cylinder also increases the risk of fire and becomes a hazard to other people involved in or trying to assist following an accident. Oxygen cylinders in the home must be stored upright and secured so that they can't fall over, if knocked, or in a minor earthquake. In a garage is ideal, it is also important to check that nothing can fall onto them, off a shelf for example. They must also be stored separate from any other gas cylinders and in a well-ventilated area. We're going to look at the fire triangle again. Both oxygen, a very, very concentrated amount, and heat, which is created by the force of the oxygen coming through a small outlet, are there every time you use an oxygen cylinder. You therefore need to be extremely careful not to add a fuel to the fire triangle. There is a number of fuel sources that are so common most wouldn't think of them the natural oils on your hands, any moisturisers that you have used, any food that may have been on your hands, and any dust that may be in or around the valve of the cylinder. It is therefore very important to thoroughly wash and dry your hands, ensuring all washing products are well rinsed off every time before using the cylinder. Do not use hand sanitizers, as these are usually alcohol based and dramatically increase the risk of fire. To reduce the risk associated with the potential of dust collecting near the valve of the cylinder, keep the white seal on until the time the cylinder is required to be connected. Vent the valve before connecting the cylinder like this. This ensures that any dust is blown from the area and will no longer pose a problem. Once you've connected the conserver, leave it connected until the cylinder is empty and it is time to connect the conserver to the next cylinder as the dust cannot get past the seal between the conserver and the cylinder. Every time you go to fit the conserver to a new cylinder, check the cylinder is oxygen. It will have a tag on it stating that it is oxygen, but it is important that you check the label on the actual cylinder. Tags can come off and be mixed up and are not a reliable check. Always have the cylinder on the ground when fitting the conserver. Holding onto the cylinder or placing it on furniture, even a table, increases the risk of the cylinder being dropped or knocked and resulting in one of the dangerous situations we've described earlier. Your conserver should look like this. It has a T-handle that secures your conserver to the cylinder post. Have this wound out when putting it on. It has two indexing pins below the valve, which is surrounded by a Bodox seal. 
These match the configuration of the holes on the cylinder post. The configuration of the pins on the oxygen conserver is specific to cylinders which contain oxygen and will not fit any other cylinder. This is the cylinder contents pressure gauge which will tell you how much oxygen is left in the cylinder when the cylinder is open. There are two barb connectors which is where your tubing will connect. This is different from the nasal tubing for your concentrator as it has two connection ports and must be connected at both of these. This is the flow selection dial which you use to select your flow rate, which is shown in the flow indicator window here. This needs to be set at zero before connecting the conserver to the cylinder. When you place your conserver over the cylinder post, the pins and valve configuration should easily fit into place. If these do not match up, do not force them. This may indicate that the gas in the cylinder you have been given is not oxygen. Take the cylinder back to the gas supply company for checking. This is a safety mechanism with gas cylinders in that all gas cylinders have specific pin and valve configurations to reduce the risk of using the wrong gas. Once the conserver is in place on the cylinder post, you tighten the T-handle by screwing it clockwise until it is firm. Hand tight is all that is required. Your cylinder is still closed, so your pressure gauge should read zero. If this has any reading on it at all, check that the cylinder is still closed. If the cylinder is still closed and the pressure gauge is not reading zero, your cylinder may be leaking. Contact the gas supplier, BOC Gases, to inform them of this and arrange the return of the cylinder immediately. The contact details of your local BOC company or BOC agent will be in the booklet you have been given. Now you open the oxygen cylinder. The needle on the gauge will move around to the green section, indicating that the cylinder is full. You connect the nasal prongs to the two oxygen outlet barbs. You must not use extension tubing with the cylinders. You can now turn the flow selection dial to the flow rate you have been prescribed. Position the nasal prongs like this, ensuring there are no kinks or twists, and breathe normally through your nose. The oxygen will come through the nasal prongs as a short pulse, followed by a continuous flow for the remainder of the inhalation and the flow stops when you are breathing out. You may notice that the oxygen only comes through to one nostril at a time. To change which side the oxygen is delivered to, change the ports on the barbs. Oxygen cylinders are intended to be used by patients when they need to leave the home or in a few occasions for patients on very low flow rates, which concentrators do not manage. Usually these are very young children and neonates. Oxygen cylinders need to be kept upright when mobilising. They can be carried like this, just like carrying a baby, in a backpack or in some kind of trolley where they are secure. They must never be carried by the cylinder post on the top. You will need to decide which is the best method for you. When you have finished your session on the cylinder, you first turn the flow selection dial to zero. You then close the valve on the oxygen cylinder, which stops the oxygen leaving the cylinder. You now turn the flow selection dial back on until the pressure gauge reads zero, and then turn the flow selection dial back to zero. This protects the conserver, and there are now two barriers preventing the oxygen escaping from the cylinder. When the cylinder is empty, you can disconnect it by turning the T handle, turning it anti-clockwise, until the conserver easily slips off the top of the cylinder and you immediately connect it to the next cylinder so that it is ready for you when you need to use it. Oxygen cylinders are obtained from BOC gases or one of their agents. An account will have been set up for you at BOC gases so that all you need to do is present to BOC gases and provide your name and address. The number of cylinders that you have been allocated is provided in the brochure you were given. This will be based on your location and anticipated need. When your cylinder runs out, you can take them to BOC Gases and swap them for a full cylinder, or in some areas delivery is available. All cylinders issued to patients are charged to the District Health Board, whether they are empty or full, so it is important that you return an empty one each time you collect a full one. If you do not think the number of cylinders you have been allocated is enough, please contact your oxygen provider to discuss this. The storage of gas cylinders can be an issue on some insurance policies. 
So we'd like to advise you to get in touch with your insurance company and check if they have any regulations around the storage of your oxygen cylinders. Your regulator must be serviced on a regular basis. There is a small label on the regulator showing the date that this is due. If your provider has not contacted you prior to this date, please contact them to organise the servicing of this device. Your nasal prongs should be checked daily to ensure they are not blocked. They can be wiped with a damp cloth. Do not use detergents or cleaners on them, as that can harden the plastic and make them uncomfortable. You can change your nasal prongs when needed to maintain a reasonable level of comfort. These should be changed several times each year. It is important to keep a spare set of nasal prongs on hand. Key points for section 4. An oxygen cylinder must be transported and stored upright and secured. Confirm if your insurance company has any additional storage requirements. In the event of a rocketing or spinning cylinder due to damage, never try to stop it. Clean and dry your hands thoroughly before using your cylinders. Always fit your conserver with the cylinder on the floor. If the conserver does not fit on easily, do not force it.